Hello everybody. So we've seen functionalism and it's time to look at some objections to functionalism. Now recall in the video on the identity theory, we saw that the main problem with the identity theory is neuronal chauvinism. It's chauvinistic. It restricts mental states only to beings with brain states just like ours. And this is deeply implausible. Functionalism, uh, of course, solves this problem, but it has an opposite problem of its own. Many people have argued that it's too liberal. It attributes mental states to all kinds of things that surely do not have mental states. So uh, let's consider some arguments to this conclusion. First, there's a thought experiment from Ned Block, the China Brain Thought Experiment. Uh, imagine that the entire nation of China is ordered to simulate the workings of a brain so that a single Chinese person takes the place of one neuron. Everybody is given two-way radios that connect them to each other and that also connect some of them to an artificial body, which provides the inputs and outputs for the brain. Calls on the two-way radios realise the same kinds of patterns as neurons causing each other to fire. Uh, and you can imagine uh, that the uh, uh, robot sees a cup, say, its eyes process the image of a cup, and then the signal is transmitted via radio to, um, say, 100,000 people, and then they send signals to various other people in the network, and then those people send signals to others, and so on, until eventually the last few hundred thousand transmit a signal back to the robot's body, and this causes it to lift its arm and pick up the cup. So, uh, once we get the inputs, outputs, and relations between internal states right, the whole nation of China will exhibit precisely the same functional organisation that the average human brain does. Well, it follows that if the functional account of mental states is right, the Chinese nation uh, as a whole will have a mind. But according to uh, Ned Block, this is extremely implausible. Uh, it certainly doesn't seem intuitive to say that the nation of China could literally experience mental states, even if it uh, was organised in this way. Um, this is one version of the, the, absent, the absent qualia problem. It seems entirely possible that there could be systems that have the right functional organisation, but that have no qualia, no experiences, no mental states whatsoever. Uh, I just want to note with the China brain, what we really have is a, a functional zombie, something that's functionally identical to a human, but that is not conscious. I introduced in the video on the identity theory neurobiological zombies. Well, the, the China brain is really a zombie argument, this time with a functional zombie. And you can run this argument in many ways. Um, so instead of having Chinese people, you could build a, a massive, massive house full of, say, billions of dogs or something and train each dog to react in particular ways so that the system of dogs replicates the functional organisation of our brains. Would this system be conscious? It seems implausible to say so. Um, it seems that it wouldn't really have any any experiences like we do. Uh, well, uh, as I say, that's that's the that's absent qualia. A similar point about qualia is made by something I've mentioned before, the inverted qualia thought experiment. Take um, take a human invert, a seemingly normal human, a seemingly perfectly normal human. Uh, in fact, he's functionally equivalent to you and his vision appears to work in the same way as yours. So if you get a load of red balls and green balls, and you're asked to pick out the green balls, you'll both pick out the green balls. And when we ask, what colour are those balls, you'll both say, they're green. Uh, you both think that grass is green and blood is red, and so on. However, what it's like for you to see red is what it's like for inverts to see green. Inverts qualia for red and green are inverted compared to yours. Uh, obviously there's no way we could detect this by giving you any tests. Invert is just as capable of, as you are of making discriminations between red and green objects. He, he applies the words red and green to precisely the same objects you apply the words to. It's just that the inner experiences associated with red and green have a, a different character for him. You've been brought up to associate red with this sensation um, but he's been brought it up to associate it with this sensation. The point is that when invert sees red, the inputs, outputs and relations to other internal states are exactly the same as when you see red. So the functionalist would have to say that you have the same mental states. But of course you don't. 
what it's like for invert to see red is different to what it's like for you to see red. So the functionalist analysis leaves something out. It doesn't account for the qualia. Qualia don't have a functional role, so functionalism doesn't, doesn't capture them. Uh, this is, you know, quite, quite a persuasive looking argument. The main response for the functionalist is generally to deny that this kind of case of inverted qualia is really possible. So they hold that if somebody is functionally equivalent to you, they would necessarily have the same qualia as you. Uh, to motivate this, consider a different case of qualia inversion, inverted loudness. Uh, imagine somebody who is functionally equivalent to you, but whose experience of volume is inverted. What it's like for him to hear a loud sound is what it's like for us to hear a quiet sound. When he stands by a jet, he experiences what we would describe as almost silent, barely a whisper. Well, is this possible? It's, it's certainly much more difficult to conceive than inverted colour qualia is. It's not so clear that inverted loudness really is coherent. Or consider hedonic inversion, somebody functionally equivalent to you but whose experiences of pain and pleasure are inverted. When he's injured, he experiences what we would call pleasure, like us, uh, he says he finds the experience deeply distressing and he goes out of his way to avoid it, nevertheless it's what we would call pleasure. On the other hand, experiences that he says he enjoys produce in him what we would call pain. In this case, we have an even stronger intuition that there's some sort of incoherence. Doesn't this idea just violate what the words pain and pleasure mean. Obviously the case of colour is much more subtle than these two, but uh, some people have argued that once you understand all of the facts about colour and how our perception of colour works, the idea of somebody who's functionally equivalent to us but who has inverted colour qualia is simply incoherent. Um, I don't have enough time to explain the arguments here, but I'll put up a, a, a link to a good article that, that defends this kind of claim. Um, on the other hand, though, inverted colour qualia don't just crop up in philosophical thought experiments. It seems that they're a real empirical possibility. There's scientific evidence for it. And this comes from cases of pseudo-normal vision. Now, obviously, uh, if inverted colour qualia are a serious empirical possibility, then it's not incoherent, no matter what any philosophers say, and any good theory of the mind would have to account for them. Um, again, I'll, I'll link an article about this, but here's the basic claim. There are three important photoreceptors in the retina. There's B cones, G cones and R cones, as in blue, green and red. And these cones contain different photopigments which control the wavelengths of light the cone responds to. In normal vision, the photopigments are of course distributed like this. Now, it can happen that due to some genetic accident, a person's G cones and R cones are filled with the same pigments. So you might end up with G cone pigment uh, in both the G and the R cones, or R cone pigment in both the G and the R cones. And this is what causes red-green colour blindness. Uh, and this is something that actually happens. This is this is you know this this really this really occurs. If you have the same pigment in both your G and R cones, you'll be red-green colour blind. Uh, you won't be able to distinguish green and red. Both the G cones and R cones will respond the same way to the same stimuli. And of course the same can happen with, you know, blue, uh, the, the B cones and G cones and so on. Um, but that's red-green colour blindness. But now imagine this case. Suppose you end up with G cone pigment in your R cones, but you also end up with R cone pigment in your G cones. Uh, both types of cone have been filled incorrectly, so the pigments have been exchanged. This is pseudo-normal vision. Now it seems that if such a person existed, their qualia for red and green would be inverted. They'd be able to make precisely the same discriminations as us, so they'd never know that there's anything wrong with them. But the way they see red would be the way we see green, and vice versa. Now, amazingly enough, at least one model of the genetics of colour vision suggests that uh, pseudo-normal vision, this, this kind of pigment swapping, occurs in 14 of every 10,000 males. So it's surprisingly, surprisingly common, if that's right. Well, at this point, the, uh, the functionalist could say, um, OK, the qualia are different, but another thing that's different is the pigment in the uh, R and G cone cells. And we have to factor that difference into our functional, functional analysis. So, in fact, somebody whose pigment is switched would not be functionally equivalent. 
The obvious problem with this kind of line is that it completely violates the spirit of functionalism. What we have here is something more like the type identity theory. The mental states in question are a product of the particular physical states that constitute them. Something that doesn't have the same visual neurobiology as us could not have the same qualia. So if this kind of response, if the functionalist holds this kind of response, then qualia are not multiply realizable. Um, and that's, that's quite a big concession, I think. So, so functionalism has problems with, with qualia. Um, the, the most striking feature of our mental lives, the feature that seems the most difficult to explain, is the fact that there's something it's like to have a mental state. Our mental states have certain qualitative characters. And this, I think, is the most mysterious feature of consciousness. The qualia, the what it's, the what it's like, they're the most important things. And the trouble with functionalism is that if we say that a mental state is defined by its causal role, by its relation to inputs, outputs, and other mental states, you know, or more technically by being a variable in some Ramsey sentence or whatever, this seems to leave out the qualia altogether. It ignores what's most mysterious about the mind. So um, we've seen the China brain that's absent qualia, and here's the inverted qualia problem, which uh, suggests that functional in functionalism has trouble with qualia. Right, time to turn to a very famous, one of the most famous arguments in philosophy of mind, John Searle's Chinese room argument, which was uh, directed uh, mainly against the machine versions of functionalism that hold that the mind is a computer program. Um, I should just note that aside from the fact that they're both criticisms of functionalism, the Chinese room has nothing to do with the China brain. They're, they're different arguments and they make different points. Um, uh, first, before I explain this, you need to understand the difference between syntax and semantics. So consider these three sentences. It is raining. It's raining. Uh, es regnet. That's, that's German, I think. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but you can read it. Uh, so in terms of the symbols used in these sentences, they're all different, but they mean the same thing. They, they all mean that it's, that it's raining. What we can say is that they are syntactically different, but semantically the same. So syntax is about form, and semantics is about meaning. Now Searle argues against the idea that minds are programmed in this way. Here's the basic structure. Premise 1. Programs are entirely syntactical. 2. Minds have semantics. 3. Syntax is not sufficient for semantics. That is, you can't get meaning just in virtue of having the right kind of form. For a common sense example, imagine that uh, waves on the beach wash some rocks in such a way that they just so happen to form these symbols here, right? Well, obviously, those symbols don't mean anything to the waves or the rock or whatever. There's no meaning there. Okay, so, therefore, minds are not com just, they're not just computer programs. Uh, so, premise, uh, premises one and two are not particularly controversial. For premise one, we know that programs work by manipulating symbols. That's all it involves, symbol manipulation, which is syntactical. Think of the Turing machine we saw in the uh, earlier video. It takes a certain symbol, a zero or a one, and manipulates the symbol per whatever instructions it has. The meaning of the symbols is completely irrelevant. Um, uh, sure, we can interpret the symbols as numbers if we want. We can say that... Uh, five ones in a row represents the number five, but the machine itself doesn't interpret them, and the machine will work the same way even if there's nobody to interpret them. Premise two is just obvious. Uh, we assign meanings to things. I can think in English because English sentences mean something to me. I understand them. Using English is not, for me, a matter of uninterpreted formal symbol manipulation. So the contentious part is premise three, and this is what the Chinese room thought experiment concerns. Can you get semantics, meaning, just by having the right kind of syntax, just by running the right kind of program? Well, if the mind is just a computer program, then of course you can. Syntax, formal sim symbol manipulation, is by itself enough to generate semantics. According to Searle, the Chinese room argument demonstrates that this is not so. So the Chinese room argument supports premise three here. Here's what Searle says. Imagine that you're locked in a room and on the wall there are two slots going to the outside world, marked in and out. 
In the room, there are many stacks of boxes containing Chinese symbols and a, a very long rule book uh, which tells you what you're supposed to do. Through the in slot, people pass you bunches of Chinese symbols. These are actually perfectly coherent sentences in Chinese being passed to you by competent Chinese speakers, uh, although you don't know that because you don't understand Chinese. You then look up the symbols in the rule book, and the rule book tells you which symbols from your many boxes of symbols you give back through the out slot. For people on the outside receiving these symbols, these are read as perfectly coherent answers to their sentence. What we have here is basically a computer that simulates understanding of Chinese. The boxes of Chinese symbols are the database, the rulebook is the program, and you, you're the hardware that implements the program as you look up things in the rulebook and carry out the steps. Um, and notice, of course, that the inputs and outputs are exactly the same as if there was somebody in the room who did understand Chinese. Uh, the Chinese people are having, uh, on the outside, are having totally coherent conversations with the room. To them, it's just like speaking to another Chinese person. So here's the point. You don't understand Chinese. Merely carrying out the right program, manipulating symbols in the right way, doesn't in itself generate any semantics, any understanding of the symbols. You cannot get semantics from syntax alone. All you've done is simulate the understanding of Chinese, but you haven't replicated it. There's a difference between simulation and replication. For example, I can run a computer program that simulates a thunderstorm. It might be a very good simulation. It might be very useful for predictions and so on. But merely by simulating the thunderstorm, I'm not going to have real raindrops in the computer. Similarly, simulating understanding doesn't necessarily replicate understanding. To have genuine understanding, you need to do more than merely implement the right program. For semantics, you need more than just the right syntax. Uh, let me just point out, Searle is not arguing that it's impossible for, say, computers made of silicon chips to have minds. All he's saying is that it's impossible for such a system to have a mind merely in virtue of whatever programs it's running. Maybe one day we will build a, a silicon chip computer with a mind. But to do that, we'll have to do more than simply make it run the right programs. The programs it runs could not in themselves constitute its mind. OK, there's an immense amount of literature on this. It really deserves its own video, but I'll explain a couple of responses. First, there's the systems response. This is probably the most popular response, and uh, it's quite simple. You say, well, OK, fine, the person in the room carrying out the program doesn't understand Chinese. We'll grant that. But that person is just one part of a larger system, and the system as a whole does understand Chinese. We attribute understanding not to the individual man in the room, but to the room as a whole, of, of which the man is just a part. Simple. Well, Searle's uh, rejoinder is about equally simple. Searle says, you have to ask yourself, why exactly is it that the person in the room doesn't understand Chinese? Well, it's because the person in the room has no way to attach meaning to the symbols. And the point is that in this regard, the room doesn't have any resources that the person does not have. If the person has no way to attach meaning to the symbols, how could the room as a whole possibly have a way to do this? Where meaning and understanding is concerned, uh, I am, and everybody else is clearly far more capable than a room is. Uh, as another sort of counter to the system's response, Searle also suggests extending the thought experiment and imagining that the person in the room memorises the database uh, and the rulebook. So he doesn't need the room anymore. He goes out and converses with people face to face in Chinese. But he still doesn't understand Chinese because all he's doing is manipulating symbols. He has no understanding of those symbols. Yet in this case, he's the entire system. Now, of course, an obvious objection to this uh, idea, this thought experiment, is that if you could go out and converse with people in Chinese, you must be able to understand it. It would be impossible to avoid picking up the meanings of words if you're out there talking to people in the real world. I, I don't think this really addresses Searle's point, though. Remember, the point of the Chinese room argument is that you can't generate understanding simply by running the right program. You can't get semantics merely from the right syntax. Now, I, I grant, granted, you surely would understand Chinese if you could converse perfectly with Chinese people. But I think Searle can hold that this understanding arises not just from manipulating symbols in the right way, but also from all the various things that go on in face-to-face -face interaction. 
Um, so the system's response, I'm not sure that works. Uh, now another popular response to the Chinese room um, that I think is a bit more powerful uh, can also be seen as a response to uh, the other thought experiment, the China brain, um, we saw earlier. Because ultimately what these thought experiments do is appeal to our intuitions. With the China brain, we have a very strong intuition that the system would not be conscious. Um, that the, uh, you know, the system of Chinese people with two-way radios, that could not be conscious. Similarly with the Chinese room, we have a strong intuition that the, the system doesn't understand. But it's entirely open to the functionalist to insist, well, sometimes intuitions are wrong. In fact, very often our intuitions, deeply held intuitions, have turned out to be wrong. Uh, even you know, a cursory examination of the history of science would, would show that. So maybe we'll just have to accept that the China brain is conscious and that the China room, uh, the Chinese room does understand things, however counterintuitive it seems. Paul and Patricia Churchland have a thought experiment of their own to push this point in response to the Chinese room, so that they construct this parody of Searle's argument. Remember, Searle's argument was, programs are entirely syntactical, minds have semantics, syntax is not sufficient for semantics, therefore minds are not just computer programs. Um, now I'll just remind you something about light. Light is part of the electromagnetic spectrum. We know that light is electromagnetic waves, but the Churchlands propose this argument. Electricity and magnetism are forces. Luminance is a property of light. Forces are not sufficient for luminance. Therefore, light is not just electricity and magnetism. Um, well, premise two and uh, premise one and two are pretty secure. The, the contentious premise here is premise three, and the Churchlands give uh, this thought experiment the luminous room to support it. Imagine a dark room, and in the dark room is a man holding a magnet. He then moves the magnet up and down very quickly, generating electromagnetic waves. Well, if electromagnetic waves in themselves are sufficient for luminance, then his moving the magnet will produce luminance. But as we all know, this is absurd. You can't produce light merely by moving magnets and producing the right forces. And yet, light is a form of electromagnetism. However we might um, respond to this, this particular thought experiment, this luminous room uh, experiment, the point is simply that intuitions can be very misleading. Prior to the full development of electromagnetic theory, this might have looked like a strong objection to it, although we can all see that it's actually quite silly. With the Chinese room, perhaps it does produce understanding, but the computations are being done too slowly for us to recognise it as such, um, just as waving magnets in a sense does produce luminance, but it's too feeble for us to see it. Well, the point is you can't trust your intuitions, and so we should be very careful with these kinds of thought experiments, with um, stuff like the Chinese room and the China brain. You have to, to tread very carefully here. Um, anyway, that's the Chinese room. Now, in recent years, Searle has produced another, um, deeper argument. The Chinese room thought experiment was supposed to establish that syntax is not sufficient for semantics. What Searle argues now is that syntax, and therefore computation, are subjective, observer-relative. Uh, they're not intrinsic features of the world. So, something only counts as having syntax, or as running a program, or as doing computations, relative to some observer. In other words, it's not just that Turing machines and Chinese rooms don't have any semantics, they don't even have any syntax in themselves, because both the semantics and the syntax arise in our interpretations of these things. Um, right, so gives the examples of things that are intrinsic features of the world. Uh, gravitation, molecules, mass. Um, Obviously, we've come up with these names, but the things those names refer to would exist whether or not there are any observers around. Gravitation, molecules, and mass are all intrinsic features of the world. On the other hand, consider a nice day for a picnic. This is clearly observer-relative. If there had been no people, no observers, there would have been no nice days for a picnic. Syntax and computation, according to Searle, are in the same category. Um, Note that whether or not something is a nice day for a picnic is a matter of interpretation. It depends on what you're looking for. So any day can be a nice day for a picnic. Um, 
depending on what you're looking for. Similarly, whether something is carrying out a computation or has syntax, that's a matter of interpretation, according to Searle. So what it comes down to is this. Anything can be a computer. For example, I could say that the pen sitting in front of me is a computer currently running the program Stay Still. Now, of course, the computer you're currently using, or even just a pocket calculator, is immeasurably more complex than a pen. But for Searle, this is a difference in degree, not in kind. When you use a computer or calculator, you press buttons and the device responds. But intrinsically, in itself, nothing that's going on in the device, the, the keystrokes, the electrical impulses, the states of computer chips, the images being displayed on the this, this screen and so on, uh, nothing there has any syntactical properties. They have a syntax because we assign a syntax to them. Searle so illustrates this point by considering a wall. So take, take one of the walls in your room. There are billions of molecules in that wall, all moving around in various ways. And here's the point. For some of the molecules in that wall, there will be a pattern of molecule movements that is functionally identical to the structure of, for example, a word processing program. So that is, by taking particular movements of molecules and assigning zeros and ones to them, we would have a structure identical to the zeros and ones of a word processing program. And this is the case for any sufficiently large object. So the wall in front of me, the road outside, the local forest, all these things are computers running a word processing program and much more. Of course, nobody would argue that walls are really word processors. But that's only because it's impossible in practice for us to use them that way. And with pens staying still, nobody calls those computers because there's just no point. That's not an e even remotely interesting kind of computer or program. Anyway, wa walls are not computers because we can't use them as computers. Calculators and laptops are computers because we can use them that way. We can, in practice, assign syntactical properties to ca calculators and laptops. They were designed and built explicitly for that purpose. But in principle, we can assign those same syntactical properties to any sufficiently large object. And of course, the same is true of the brain. Just as you can replicate the functional structure of the brain using Chinese people and two-way radios, so a sufficiently large wall would have some pattern of molecule movements that also replicates that structure. The syntax, the form, is something we assign because we have practical reasons to do so, just like the semantics is. So we can sum up. Searle's views with a couple of slogans. First, syntax is not sufficient for semantics, and that's what the Chinese room argument concerns. Second, syntax is observer relative. It's not intrinsic to the physics. Nothing intrinsically has syntactical properties. Nothing is intrinsically a computer or a program. It's a matter of interpretation. Therefore, the idea that the brain is a computer and the mind a computer program tells us absolutely nothing about how the brain and the mind really work. Well, actually, I, I say that nothing is intrinsically a computer. Uh, the one exception to this, of course, uh, is, 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 is our brains. Um, we, we obviously do compute things, and that's not a matter of interpretation. If I add, you know, 27 to 56, I am engaging in a computation. But when a computer does that, that's a matter of me interpreting it that way. So obviously... Um, t essentially then, the having a syntax uh, or running a program, that's observer relative, so you can't appeal to that to explain mental states. Um, summing up what we've seen so far, I mentioned before that, uh, you know, in, in other videos, that there are two big problems for physicalist theories of the mind. Functionalism, as I've said, is not necessarily physicalist, but it is compatible with physicalism, so it inherits these problems, and they are Qualia and intentionality. If mental states are ultimately composed of bits of matter, why is there something it's like to have a mental state? And why do mental states have this weird property of directedness, aboutness? These thought experiments demonstrate how functionalism in particular has difficulty with these. The China brain in inverted qualia suggests that functionalism doesn't explain qualia. The Chinese room suggests that functionalism doesn't explain intentionality. One more problem for functionalism. We've seen that Searle argues that syntax is observer relative. Similarly, might we argue that functions are observer relative? Well, there's an argument that functions do not exist objectively in the external world, but only in virtue of an individual's purposes. Something performs a function only relative to the individuals who interpret it that way. Consider hearts again. 
In the previous video, I described the heart as a functional kind, so whether it's made out of muscle, muscle or out of metal and plastic is irrelevant. But is that right? There is, after all, a sense in which we can say that an artificial heart is not a real heart. The real heart is the thing that currently inside my body. We describe an artificial heart as a heart in virtue of our intentions for it, but the heart inside my body is a heart in virtue of its biological constitution. This is actually another point uh, raised, raised by John Searle. In describing the heart as a functional kind, as something that pumps blood around the body, we have to bear in mind that pumping blood is important to us because it's necessary for things like staying alive. But suppose that the only thing about the heart that we cared about was that it made a thumping sound. We're a race of very musical people and we're really interested in the thumping beats the heart makes, but we don't care about anything else. In this case, we would give a very different description of what functional kind the heart is. So we give a very different uh, description um, of what it is that makes something a heart. And this, of course, would lead to very different understandings of things like heart disease. The point is that when we describe the function of something, there's always a normative judgment involved. That is, there's always a judgment about which features or uses of the thing are important to us. If this is right, then talk of functions presupposes talk of mentality, in which case you could hardly define mental states in terms of their functions. We can push this problem another way by considering uh, an unfortunate case of a fetus whose heart never develops properly. Its heart does not, never has, and never will pump blood. Yet it's still a heart. A defective heart is still a heart. But if what it is to be a heart is to pump blood in a certain way, how can, how can that be a heart? Well, actually, this suggests um, a possible line of response for the functionalist. Uh, perhaps a functionalist can appeal to natural selection. We can say that a heart is a functional kind, a heart is something that pumps blood around the body, and what makes the heart this functional kind is that this is what the heart was selected to do. Humans uh, often select things to serve certain purposes, cups to hold water, chairs to sit on, uh, when we... Uh, build complex things like cars, we select various parts to serve various functions. But what modern evolutionary theory tells us is that selection can be completely blind. There doesn't need to be an agent selecting things. Selection can happen through blind processes. Hearts were selected to pump blood. And that's what makes the heart the, the kind of functional kind it is. That's why the heart is uh, a functional kind. It's something that pumps blood, because that's what it was selected to do. Whether this kind of response works depends on um, very controversial issues in the philosophy of biology, which I don't really have enough time to go into. I just want to know one of them, the main problem here. The main problem with this response, appealing to selection only works if the trait in question was, in fact, selected. It's important to bear in mind that many biological traits are not selected in any way at all. Um, Stephen Jay Gould and Richard Lewontin drew a famous analogy with architecture, and I'll, I'll put up their article about this if I can find it. It's a very famous article. It's worth, worth, worth reading. In architecture, suppose you have a rectangular structure and then you build an arch in it. Well, then at the top of the arch, you'll get these two spaces called spandrels. Uh, and, of course, uh, you, can, you can do things with the spandrels. You can put pictures in them and make them look nice and so on. But notice that spandrels uh, arise, in a sense, by accident. They needn't be designed for any purpose. Spandrels are simply a necessary consequence, a byproduct of the shape of the arch against the rectangular structure. The analogy here is that there are lots of biological spandrels. There are lots of features that were not selected for, but are merely byproducts of things that were selected for. Uh, a classic example is uh, the case of some foxes in Russia, um, and they, they wanted to domesticate them, to make them tamer. So they selectively bred the foxes for tameness. But what happened was that in removing the aggression, in changing the psychology of the foxes, they also ended up changing many of the physiological traits as well. Basically, as the foxes became tamer, they started looking more like domesticated dogs. They weren't, they weren't able merely to remove the aggression uh, without changing the physical, the physiological features of the foxes. And this shows how various traits are, are interconnected. Relative to the goal of selecting for less aggression, the dog-like features were accidental byproducts. They were spandrels. 
Um, and, and then you can uh, notice that those features, those accidental byproducts, might have other benefits. For example, perhaps the dog-like features make the wolves look cute, uh, make the foxes look cuter to humans, so humans are less likely to go out hunting them. Spandrels can be beneficial. Now, obviously, the functionalist can't appeal to the fact that a trait was selected to do something if that trait is a spandrel, because spandrels aren't selected to do anything. So, what if a great deal of our cognitive abilities are just spandrels? Gould himself pointed out that uh, an organ like the brain, which is incredibly complex, is bound to produce all sorts of spandrels. Um, Noam Chomsky, the linguist, suggested that fundamental elements of our ability to use language are spandrels. I'm not going to evaluate uh, any of these claims, um, I just want to note them, but you can see the problem for the functionalist. If we say that what makes something a functional kind is, that, is, is what it was selected to do, and we maintain a functionalist analysis of mental states, then we have to establish that all of our cognitive processes were in fact selected, and that doesn't seem so plausible. So this is a bit of a problem. Um, well anyway, that's, that's functionalism, and uh, I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Uh, there are many different varieties of functionalism. There are many important things I haven't touched on in, in this video or the last, but I think that will do as an introduction. Uh, I might explore it further in later videos. Anyway, that's enough for now. Um, I hope it was he helpful, so thank you for watching, and uh, I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.